As Luther finally made his way to Rome, he was hoping to find peace, that peace that had long eluded him. He was hoping to experience that blessed assurance that had in the past and had in the past proved to be nothing other than a mirage. But his hopes were quickly dashed because Rome was not as he had, had imagined it to be heaven on earth, but rather it was teeming with people who were engaged in all kinds of sordid behavior, even the clergy. And so rather than finding that much-needed, blessed assurance, Luther left that place with an even more tormented soul, but for vastly different reasons. As we just saw in that video clip, Luther is just beginning to see that what he's been taught is a lie, that the way in which he's been living his life is a lie. Standing there at the top of the steps, it's just beginning to dawn on him that God cannot be bought off, as it were, with a few coins and empty prayers. God demands far more, far more than is humanly possible. And thankfully, Luther and the other reformers would come to discover that God himself meets those strict demands for us, that he meets those in the person and work of Jesus Christ. And therein lies peace, not only for Luther, but also for us. Therein lies much needed assurance, not only for him, but also for us and people of every age. Ever since the serpent called God's character into question in the Garden of Eden, people have thought the worst of him. They have viewed God as a petty God who is out to get us. It is a tit-for-tat relationship. You lie at work and on the way home you get a flat tire. You disobey your mom and you get a C on your test. Or people have imagined that God is distant, unconcerned, or unaware of what's going on in our lives. Or maybe worse yet, that God is an angry God that must be appeased, appeased by sacrifice. And or the four Ps, prayer, pilgrimage, acts of penance, and monetary payments. but that's not the way God is. And if you look at the vast majority of the world's religions, they are founded in, based upon those views of God and those approach of coming to God. I can't help but think of a story that Laura told us earlier this year while she was on furlough. She spoke at our international dinner about her work among the Kham Tibetans. And she told us about meeting these two elderly women who were on pilgrimage to a holy shrine. And every step, or maybe every three steps, I don't remember which, she said these women would get down, prostrate on the ground, and then they would stand up, and they would take another step, or two, or three, and they would lay themselves on the ground, On and on it went, mile after mile, day after day. And why did they do that? Because they believed that was one way in which they could demonstrate their sincerity, where they could demonstrate their true repentance. And they believed, they told her, that in so doing, it increased the likelihood that they would be forgiven. We, of course, think to ourselves, that's crazy. Uh, Who would believe in such a thing? Be careful. Because that may be you and me. Despite the clarity with which we see people living lies, we are often blinded to the fact that we live our lives according to similar lies. In particular for us, it's about being good. 
that if we're not careful, we give the distinct impression that being good is one of the determining factors that gets us into heaven. When somebody dies, what do we often say? Oh, that was a good person. We never would say that person was a sinner and the only way in which they're saved is by the grace of God. We say, oh no, that person was a good person and we begin to list all the things that he or she did so we are susceptible to the same kind of lie. It just demonstrates itself in different ways. Please don't misunderstand me. Are we to be good? Yes, Are we to live lives of obedience unto the Lord? Absolutely. As we just heard in our reading from 1 John, he says, we know that we are in him. What does it say? It doesn't say that. Well, it does say that. (laughs) He's, he's, He's turning it around a little bit. He says, whoever says he knows him, knows Jesus, but does not do what he commands is a liar. And goes on to say, whoever claims to live in Jesus but does not must also live as Jesus did. So it stands to reason that if we are called to live as Jesus did, that 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 will include good works and that will include obedience. And yet, goodness and obedience do not increase the likelihood that we're going to heaven. In fact, goodness and obedience may keep us out of heaven. They may keep us out of heaven if we trust in them rather than in Jesus. They may keep us out of heaven if we trust in them along with Jesus. That if we seek to mix our goodness with God's grace in Christ. Because grace plus anything is no longer grace. That if we add something to grace, we've subtracted everything. That if it's grace plus prayer, one of the four Ps, it's no longer grace. If it's grace plus some pilgrimage to some holy site, it's no longer grace. If it's grace plus acts of penance, it's no longer grace. If it's grace plus monetary payments, it's no longer grace. Grace plus any kind of good works is no longer grace. It is grace alone. It must stand alone or it is no longer grace. And that is the wonderful discovery, rediscovery of the Reformation onward, the glorious truth of the gospel that we are saved by grace alone. Through faith alone in Christ Jesus alone. Amen? Amen. I mean, if we do not get that thing, that is first thing. If we do not get that thing down, then anything else that Jesus would teach us makes no difference. I mean, we can rail about the things going on in our society. We can complain about this candidate and that. We can bemoan all those things. But if we don't get the first thing done correctly, if we do not understand that it is by grace alone, none of those things really matter. I don't know about you, but when I hear 1 John chapter 2, those initial verses, I, I think of Paul's rhetorical questions in Romans chapter 6. And in that sixth chapter, you may recall, he says, What then shall we say? Shall we go on sinning that grace may abound? And if you read chapter 5, he speaks so powerfully about grace. Grace. That where sin increases, grace increases more and more. And yet having spoken so powerfully about grace, he doesn't want anybody to presume upon that grace. Since we cannot sin beyond God's ability to forgive, he says we ought not even try. And as he lays out for us, why would we even conceive of doing such a thing? Do we not know who we are in Christ, that we have died with Christ and we have been raised with Christ to live in newness of life? So why in the world would we even entertain giving in to wanton sin? And like Paul, John speaks so powerfully about sin and grace. 
As we saw last week, he exposes one of the pervasive lies that I'm okay, you're okay. That he lays out for us the pervasiveness of sin. It's not only that we do sinful things, but that we are by nature sinful. He not only addresses the pervasiveness of sin, but the provision that God has made in the blood of Jesus Christ. But here too, there can be a misunderstanding. That since sin is part of our nature, why do we even bother struggling against us? It is a hopeless cause because we know that sooner or later we're going to give in to it. And besides, it says that if we confess our sins, God forgives us. So why not just go with the flow? Well, to any and all who would entertain presuming upon God's grace, St. John tenderly writes, My dear children... I write this so that you will not sin. Doesn't that seem a little strange to you? That he would write that you will not sin? We think, is is that even possible? Well, let's make it clear. Paul or, or John is not putting forth for us this idea of perfectionism, this notion that we can be sinless this side of heaven. Rather, John, moved by the Holy Spirit, is reminding us that lives characterized by sin is incompatible with those who have experienced the grace of God in Christ Jesus. That as amazing as grace is, it does not give us the freedom to abuse it. And yet no sooner does he, he state something of that fact that he goes on to remind us that we can rely upon it wholeheartedly. My dear children, I, I write this to you that you will not sin, but if anybody does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the Righteous One. He is the atoning sacrifice, not only for our sins, but also for the sins of the whole world. And there are three things I believe these two verses teach us about grace. And the first is this, grace is inclusive. If anybody sins... So grace doesn't only apply to a certain kind of person, maybe a Jewish person as opposed to a Gentile or a man as opposed to a woman or somebody who has money and power and prestige as as opposed to somebody with, with little notoriety and no money. It says if anybody sins, anybody that's inclusive. The second thing that these verses teach us about grace is its absolute nature. That grace doesn't only apply to misdemeanor kinds of sins. The small sins, we would say, like lying and gossiping and all those things. You know, it doesn't only apply to to unintentional sins. Well, I I didn't mean to do that. I mean, I'm really sorry. But, But it applies to felony kinds of sins like murder and adultery and a host of other things. It applies to willful sins, those that are born of of self-loving hearts, those that hearts that are rebellious, that God's grace in Christ is absolute. Jesus is the atoning sacrifice, not only for our sins, but also for the sins of the world. Because if it were anything else than absolute, if it was not all-encompassing, guess what? We would live our lives in fear, and we would live our lives with uncertainty. We'd say, well, I think grace applies to those things, but not opposed to those things, but we know that it applies to all sins. And the third thing that it teaches us, and not surprisingly, is the source of that inclusive and absolute grace. It's none other than Jesus Christ. 
And it describes him that Jesus is our advocate with the Father. That Jesus stands alongside of us, offering us much needed assurance. Picture a court of law. As our advocate, Jesus isn't trying to convince the judge that we're innocent. But rather, he acknowledges that we are guilty even as we do, but he pleads his blood. That the one who stands beside us is the one who hung in our place upon the cross. And that is why he has become for us that atoning sacrifice. And not only for ours who are gathered here. But Jesus is that atoning sacrifice not only for our sins, but also the sins of the whole world. You know, we live in a world that loves to upsell and add on. So you go into into a fast food restaurant, which you shouldn't and I shouldn't, but occasionally we do. You know, it's one of the most sinful pleasures. Um, You go in and and, and you order a combo meal, and usually the response that they have, would you like to supersize that? Thank you, I'm big enough already. Um, No, so so you go in, they want to supersize it. Uh, If you go in and buy a car, they want to sell you the car that has all the gadgets and all the creature comforts. I mean, who doesn't want heated outside mirrors? I'll take heated leather seats instead myself. And have you noticed nowadays that even when you purchase the cheapest electronic device, they want to sell you a warranty? It's $12, and you want to sell me an $8 warranty? I mean, all of these things prey upon our human nature, our desire for more, for more stuff and more comfort and a greater sense of security. But the truth is, The church is not immune to upselling and add-ons. That even when it comes to grace, people want to add on things to grace. They want to upsell in a sense. They want to put, well, you get it's grace plus prayers, it's grace plus good deeds. But that is a lie that has dire consequences for us. And that is why the lie needs to be exposed. And more than that, the truth needs to be revealed. That Jesus is enough. That as our advocate, Jesus is enough. That as the atoning sacrifice, not only for our sins, but also the sins of the world, Jesus is enough. Make that Jesus is more than enough. Let us pray. Oh Lord Jesus, we acknowledge that you are more than enough. We thank you that you are our advocate, our strong defense, that you stand alongside of us, not claiming our innocence, but pleading your blood. We, along with everyone else, is prone to trust in ourselves and in the things that we have done But Lord, we pray that you would work faith in our hearts in such a way that we would see those things for what they are. That we would know that there is nothing that we need to do or can do because you have done it all. We pray, Lord Jesus, that you would work in our hearts and in the hearts of others that we might have that peace that passes all understanding. That we might experience that blessed assurance throughout the course of our lives knowing that in you there is forgiveness, there is freedom, there is hope, there is peace, there is purpose, and there is eternity. And we pray that as that lie creeps into our lives, that the glorious truth of your gospel would drive it out. And that as we see others literally prostrating themselves on the ground or engaging in all kinds of other things, that they might 
um, somehow earn your favor, get you to like them, get you to forgive them, open the heaven, heaven to them, Lord, that we would help them to see that that is a lie and that you are for them and for all of us, even the entire world, more than enough because you are our advocate, the righteous one. You are that atoning sacrifice, not only for our sins, but also for the sins of the world. We bless you and we praise you for your great goodness. Amen. Thank you.